Hello, this is Link on Air, and today I will be reviewing Insanely Twisted Shadow Planet. Now, this review's been a long time coming. I remember back when it first came out back in 2011. The game was touted as a Metroidvania game, and since Metroidvania is my all-time favorite video game subgenre, I was ecstatic when I first saw the various gameplay trailers. The game looked absolutely amazing. Visually. I didn't know what to make of the gameplay I saw, but it looked like it would be enjoyable. Though, much to my dismay, by the end of my first playthrough I was rather... disappointed. But it's been four years since then, so has my opinion changed? Without further delay, let's get started. There isn't much of a story to speak of. From the opening cutscene, all I could gather was some giant twisted mass in space shoots a thing across space that ends up hitting the sun of an alien solar system. Then the sun turns into a shadow planet for some reason, which shoots more things at the planets orbiting it, making them become twisted as well. You play as one of the aliens from one of the infected planets, and you must fly into the sun to where, um, unshadow twist it, I guess? I suppose I shouldn't be questioning it too much, seeing how there is apparently a life in the oceans on the shadow planet, sun, whatever. Seeing how the story is hardly the focus, it doesn't really matter, but I do have a question. Why call it Insanely Twisted Shadow Planet if we're flying into the shadow-infected sun? Your home planet also gets infected, so why not explore that? Or furthermore, why have the twisted mass hit the sun rather than just hit the planet in the first place? You'd get the same effect, I'd imagine, and it would be a lot less convoluted. The gameplay of Insanely Twisted Shadow Planet is that of a 2D exploration-based game with some puzzle and shooter elements. I say 2D exploration because I can't bring myself to call this a Metroidvania game. It certainly contains similar elements to Metroidvania, such as obtaining power-ups and backtracking to obtain previously unobtainable items. I'd say the biggest thing it gets wrong in regards to being a Metroidvania game is interconnectivity between different parts of the world. Progression in the game is largely linear, since the only way the different areas of the game are connected is through a central hub, and it's impossible to enter new areas without the proper power-ups from the next area in the sequence. I can't say for certain whether Metroidvania was the actual intent of the developers, as that claim was made primarily by journalists, but if that was the intent, then they failed. Another thing that struck me about the gameplay is that it's not a platformer, despite being a side-scrolling exploration game. It's not really a complaint, but it's certainly strange to me, as most games that take this approach normally do it from a top-down perspective. I do feel like this approach to exploration does take something away from the sense of fulfillment one gets from ascending a room in, say, Metroid, which isn't something that would normally occur to you while playing Metroid, but when that weight is taken away you definitely notice it. Though it did change their approach to the level design, and it's less about actually traversing the environment and more about solving environmental physics-based puzzles, which, to their credit, are rather cleverly designed with power-ups such as a claw for dragging objects around and a gravity beam, which they really make the most out of through the use of specific physics-based objects and obstacles. There is combat in the game as well, but it's rather unimpressive. It's a shooter that uses the analog stick framing. I normally wouldn't go over controls, but this bothers me a fair bit, since you have full 360 degree aiming and your shots are very small. It can make trying to hit the smaller enemies rather annoying. I imagine playing on PC would resolve the precision naming issues. Fortunately, you can usually ignore standard enemies or plow through them with your short-range buzzsaw power-up. The basic gun, however, is next to useless against anything other than bosses. And interestingly enough, the boss fights are actually quite enjoyable as they test you on your skills with newly obtained power-ups, which I suppose makes them more like puzzles than bosses, but they are easily the highlight of the game. I was especially impressed by the final boss fight, which tests you on everything you've learned, which is rare these days. I know it sounds like I dislike the gameplay overall, but I don't. It's just different and a bit flawed. 
Now, the visuals. By now, you probably noticed that this game looks absolutely gorgeous. It uses a silhouette-based art style similar to Limbo, but with more color and personality. The early areas in the game feel truly alien in appearance. It makes the world feel alive, at least until you reach Area 3, the ice level, which is easily one of the blandest looking areas I've seen in a game. I outright hate how it looks. I can't really blame them, as trying to make a silhouette-based ice level visually stimulating sounds fairly difficult, but if it doesn't work, then change it. Do a lava level instead, at least that could be interesting to look at. The areas following the ice stage are mechanical, which is a bit disappointing seeing how the organic environments early on are easily the best looking sections on the game. Granted, Area 4 doesn't look bad. It's got a lot going on visually and managed to remain visually stimulating. Area 5, on the other hand, is... dark. Just dark. I have no idea why they made that design decision, but that's just how it is. It's not bad, but it makes navigation a pain. I'd say the absolute best part of the visuals is the bosses. They are, well, well, gorgeous. There's no other word for it, really. They're good. Really good. And kudos to Michael Gagne for the design work. Seriously, I love these visuals. This is easily one of the best looking 2D games I've ever played. Ice level aside. The soundtrack is... Eh. The majority of the tracks are well composed, but I can't shake the feeling that I've heard them somewhere else before. They're mostly ambient pieces, which do a good job at setting the tone, but occasionally the tracks contain what sounds like somebody hitting a metal slab with a hammer, and I just find it unpleasant. The ambient tracks get better as the game progresses, in inverse proportion to the visual design, but overall I found the soundtrack unremarkable. Overall I give this game a 6 out of 10. The story is non-existent, but it isn't the focus so I didn't factor it into the score. The gameplay is alright, it does nothing to push the envelope, nor does it come across as fun with the exception of the boss fights and some cleverly designed puzzles. Uh, the visuals of the game are absolutely gorgeous, and I should probably stop gushing about that. And the soundtrack is just unimpressive. I do recommend this game if the idea of exploring the beautiful environments and seeing the slick boss design sounds appealing, but otherwise I'd say you'd be better off with Super Metroid, or Shadow Complex, if you're looking for better gameplay and experience overall. I really do want to love this game, but visuals are not enough to carry a game for me. I'd really like to see another game by Shadow Planet Productions, preferably with more enjoyable gameplay. <sighs> anyway, have a great night, and if you'd like to see more content like this, be sure to like and subscribe. Goodbye.